As you can see, I'm standing next to our car that has some serious windshield problems. In fact, we're going to have to get this fixed. It's highly illegal. And it made me think of the last time we had to have a windshield replaced. We called the experts at SafeLight, and this now will become a uh, commercial for SafeLight. They came out, and actually Brad came out. I met him when he got there, and it happened to be a Monday, so I was writing a message for the next Sunday, Sunday. service. And so I went back in the house and, you know, left him alone for some 30, 45 minutes. And then I just thought, you know, I need to go back out and check on Brad. So I went back out there and I asked Brad how it was going. And he said, it's going good. It's simple. He made it look simple, but I tell you, I could never have figured out how to do that. And we got talking and uh, I asked him about his life and he just opened up. I mean, he just began to share about uh, his life, his family and primarily about how he had been an alcoholic, how he was an alcoholic. And he said, so what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm preparing a message. He said, a message? Like, what kind of message, Brad said. I said, well, I'm a pastor. He said, you're a pastor? <laughs> that always scares me when people react that way. I said, yeah, I am. He said, well, tell me about your church, the church where you pastor. And so I told him a little bit about it, and then I transitioned into what we were attempting to do at that time at the ministry we were at, and that is to help people not just sit and listen and leave, but to interact during the message and even after the message, sit around round tables and, and just open up with one another and care for each other and process what they'd heard and what they'd read and, and really with the goal of growth. And as I described this, he quit working. Now, that's okay. You know, I wasn't paying him by the hour, but he just quit working and he was spellbound. And when I took a breath and said, so that's kind of what we're doing. He said, wow. He said, if there was really a church like that, I would join that church. He went on to tell me that how he had quit going to church a long time ago. His family went without him and, uh, you know, he believed in the idea of just sobriety through community, and he described AA to me. It wasn't the first time I'd heard of AA. AA has been around for a long time. It was started by a guy by the name of Bill Wilson many years ago. And I'll bet you Bill Wilson, or Bill W as they call him, as a friend, they call each other, are you a friend of Bill W's? Anyway, he described to me what their meetings are like. They start with transparency, they include accountability and affirmation. And then certain individuals sponsor each other and help each other along in their process, in their growth towards sobriety. And as he described that, you know, he started getting excited about it. And he said, I love AA. AA has saved my life. He didn't just say AA is a good thing. He said, it has saved my life. It has saved my, my family. And again, he looked at me and he said, if there was ever a church like you're describing, where there was that kind of community and accountability, he said, I would go to that church. I've thought a lot about that since uh, he, I talking to Brad that day. And I've researched it. And I don't know if you realize that AA has 2 million members in 10,000 groups. They call them communities or fellowships or you know organizations around the world. I wonder if all those years ago when Bill W. started AA, if he had any idea what it was that it would come to. And I've thought about that because as we're looking at the early church and really trying to figure out what was the blueprint of the early church, if you weren't with us last week, we talked about the fact that they were devoted, Acts 2.42 tells us, they were devoted to four basic ordinary things. It wasn't complicated. There were no uh, you know, fog machines or no loud music, uh, no fancy buildings, four things. And one of those things that we talked about last week is they were devoted to fellowship. And as we studied it, it ends up looking kind of like an AA meeting or like that organization where people care for one another and do life together and help each other grow. So we're gonna proceed from, from that idea the devotion to the fellowship to uh, the next concept that comes from the blueprint of the early church. And I will get this fixed, I promise. So let me introduce this in kind of a strange way. One of my favorite games is called Tribond. Tribond is a simple game 
uh, they give you three people, three events, three whatever, and you got to find the common thread between the three. What connects them? What binds them together is the idea. I love games like that. And so let me give you an easy one. I know you can get this one. Okay, let's say Forrest Gump, Apollo 13, and Big. Got it? My distant cousin, very distant cousin, Tom Hanks, starred in all three of those movies. So that's how it works. Now let's keep playing this game, but now we're going to go in a different direction. I'm going to give you four events that took place in the life of Jesus. All right? And I'll read one of them to you that describe the others pretty much. And I want to see if you can find what they all have in common. So here we go. I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Okay, let's pause there. Uh, he has one daughter. She's dying. He's desperate. He falls, you know, at Jesus' feet and says, please come and save her. A spoiler alert, Jesus does go. He's going to have a little uh, a side thing go on for a second that we're going to talk about. He does go, and she has already died. She was so sick that she died, and she, he raises her from the dead. Okay, so that's the first story, okay, the daughter of Jairus, all right? Now, on his way to Jairus' house, this is what happens. Verse 42 of chapter 8 of Luke. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. The book of Mark tells us that she had seen many doctors and she was out of money okay so the, the Affordable Care Act didn't work for her surprisingly and she was flat out out of money and so she comes to Jesus So verse 44 picks up the story and says coming up behind Jesus she touched the fringe of his robe immediately the bleeding stopped now what is going on there she touches the fringe of his robe. Uh, this that I'm wearing around my neck, you probably recognize it. It's called a tallit, all right? It's a prayer shawl of the Jewish people. Back in Jesus' time, they used these. But they didn't just have uh, these things with the, the uh, fringes like this at the bottom of prayer shawls. They had them at the bottom of their robes as well. And this little tassel here is very important. This little tassel from the book of Deuteronomy and the entire Old Testament, you find references to the fact that this separates God's people out. Otherwise, this is like a sweatshirt with no name on it. But once the tassel is attached, now you know they belong to God is the idea. And especially a teacher or a person, uh, a leader in the Jewish community would have these and would have a blue string in here that would tell people he's a man of authority. Literally what this woman is doing is she is touching that fringe. This fringe is called a tzitzit. Can you say that? A tzitzit. It's very easy. This is a tzitzit. And when she touched this, she wasn't looking for some kind of a uh, magical thing to happen. She was praying and hoping that by touching what represented his authority, that that would bring her some kind of fortune, all right, that literally his authority would spill onto her. So verse 45 goes on to say this, Jesus says, who touched me? Everyone denied it. And Peter said, master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. That's to say, You're, are you serious? Asking who might have touched you? But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. For I tell you that healing power went out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Listen to this, verse 48, Jesus says to her, don't you ever do that again. 
don't ever get close to me again. In fact, a teacher, really only his, his uh, very intimate students or family, usually family could touch this part of his robe. Okay, he doesn't say that. He says this, daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace. Daughter, can you imagine that? This woman goes from being desperately you know, sick and at the end of her rope to doing something very brave and then he calls her daughter. Okay, so that's the second story. Okay, the, first the third story. story, okay, we're looking for a common theme amongst these stories. The third story is the very well-known story of Jesus walking on the water in the midst of a storm and his disciples seeing him and they're terrified, like, what is that out on the water? And he says, you know, it's, it's me, you know. And at that point, Peter, if you remember, says, Lord, uh, invite me to come to you or can I come to you out on the water? And he says, well, come on, come on, you know. He gets out and you know what happens, right? No, before he sinks, what happened? We always go to him sinking in the water. What happened? Peter was the only man in history besides Jesus that could walk on water. He walked on water, not very long. It says he saw the wind, which that's a whole nother story that we can't get into, but you know, the wind is invisible. I don't know how you see the wind unless you have just entered into another dimension. But he saw the wind and he began to sink. And then in verse 29 of Matthew 14, it says that he cried out, Lord, save me. So he comes to Jesus. He realizes I'm in deep water here. Lord, save me, and Jesus saves him. That's story number three. Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead. The woman who has been bleeding for 12 years is healed. Peter cries out, Lord, save me, while he's sinking in the water. The fourth one is found in Mark chapter 7. And this is really interesting. I'm going to read it to you. It's verse 24. Jesus left the place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. Tyre is in a pagan part of that area. All right. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Okay. She is in the Old Testament. These people were called the Canaanites. Okay. They were the enemies of God's people. So here's this woman who Jesus already knows. She's one of those people. She cries out and says, my, my daughter has a demon. Please heal her. Jesus. Jesus says something really interesting here. He says, let the children eat. It's not right to give the, the food that's meant for the children to dogs. Now, what is he saying? He's calling her a dog. I mean, he's calling her people dogs. He's calling them, you are not my children. You're not the children of God. Now, at first glance, you go, wow, and, and Jesus is kind, and Jesus is caring, Jesus is compassionate. Listen to her response. She said, even the dogs get the scraps off the table. Jesus' response to her is classic. He says, good answer. And I believe, you know, it's between the lines, and we don't get these details, but I believe he probably winked at her and said, good answer, good answer. I do have compassion on people that aren't a part of God's chosen nation is the idea. What she was doing is acknowledging, I know, I know I'm not an Israelite, I know I'm not Jewish, I know I'm not Hebrew, but I'm still begging, I'm still coming to you and begging for your help. And Jesus cast the demon out of her daughter. All right, four stories, Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead, the bleeding woman is healed, Peter is saved from drowning, and this pagan woman has her request answered by Jesus by healing, by, by casting out a demon out of her daughter. So there they are, four stories, four events, four instances where people interact with Jesus. What is the common thread? I'm going to ask you to pause the video right now and talk amongst yourselves. Or at least if you're watching this by yourself, just pause it and think it through. What is the common thread? What's the common uh, denominator between these four stories? Okay, I would love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear what you came up with. 
there is there may be more than one right answer, but there is a right answer to this one. And the answer is it's it's pretty simple, kind of like the Tom Hanks one I just did. It's pretty simple. They all cried out for, they all sought Jesus. They all went to him. They all cried out for him. That's the common theme there amongst those four. Let's play. So let's go back to that original blueprint, Acts 2.42. The people who gathered, the church, the people of the way, gathered, and it says they were devoted, right, to the apostles' teaching. We call that studying Jesus. They were devoted to the fellowship. We talked about that last week. That is sharing Jesus with one another. Uh, the third one is the breaking of bread. We're going to come back to that next week. The fourth element. These are just kind of normal things. We're not talking jumping out of an airplane here. The fourth is... They were devoted to prayer. Most people are, are uncomfortable with prayer. All of a sudden, you start mentioning prayer, and you ask people about their prayer life, and we get overwhelmed by this sense of guilt, right? Because I've never met anybody that says, Oh, uh, prayer is a, that's a no-brainer for me. I pray, I pray too much. You ever heard anybody say that? I pray too much. I need to cut back on prayer a little bit. You know, if you say, would, would you mind praying here in public? Most people, you know, they, their eyes get big. And they look at you like, what is it you're asking me to do? There's something about the topic of prayer. In fact, all the years I've been teaching, whenever I teach on either money, finances, personal finances, or prayer, people tend to not like that, right? It's just too personal for them. And I wanted to give you all that background to set you up to realize, you know what? We don't have to get nervous when we talk about prayer. We really don't. It was so common in the early church that nobody would shake in their boots at the thought of praying in front of somebody or having to answer for their prayer life. It, it just was a common thing that they did. So I want to ask you, is prayer routine for you? Is it routine? Is it is it part of your routine? I know what your routine in, includes. It includes sleeping and it includes uh, time on the internet. It includes brushing your teeth and eating hopefully three good meals a day and some snacks in between. Is prayer part of that routine of your everyday life? Another question. Is prayer part of the routine of the local church? I can tell you, after all the years I've been in the local church, typically on a Sunday morning or whenever you gather, but on a Sunday morning is usually when we gathered, we might devote two minutes out of an hour and a half to prayer. I mean, there were exceptions. There were special focuses on prayer, but really, you know, prayer at the beginning, prayer at the end, prayer before communion, uh, certainly a little prayer before, you know, they ask for money. But it, it, it's like two minutes of the entire time. It's not part of, it's part of the routine, but it doesn't take up much time is the idea. So how routine is prayer? It was very routine to the early church. In fact, typically in the local church, if you want to gather a really small crowd, you know, and you can announce it for weeks, just call a prayer meeting. Usually that's the way to gather a small crowd, not a big crowd. You need, you need entertainment for a big crowd. Now, why is that? Number one, for sure, the enemy opposes prayer. He knows the power of prayer and he opposes that. But number two, there is a mystique. Uh, there is uh, a mystery to this idea of praying. Now, who really has the corner on the market? Is the so since the early church had this as an element that was essential to them, I mean, that was one of the four things they did. Essentially, they prayed together. They were devoted to it. It wasn't, oh, we better throw out a prayer here so we can get some more money or, you know, so people can know that, you know, God's around. Why is it that we don't devote ourselves to prayer? I want to take you back to the four stories now, right. okay? So, uh, Jairus' daughter raised from the dead, uh, the woman healed of bleeding, Peter sinking in the water, and then the final story where the pagan woman, the Canaanite woman, gets her plea answered, and that is to have her daughter freed of the demon. What do they all have in common? They all sought Jesus. What I want to do is I want to take the mystery out of prayer, okay, if we can do that. It's not that mysterious. It's actually what happened in all those situations. In fact, all of those you could say were prayer. It was reaching out to the Son of God saying, I need you. I need help. I need your attention. You know, 
And, and that's as simple as it is. It really is. We, we make it so complicated that people are intimidated by it. There's nothing to be intimidated by. It's simply saying, Lord, here I am. I need help. I'm in this situation. Okay. Now it's much more than that in the sense that as you know him more, you won't just be asking for stuff, but it truly is reaching out to God. It's just saying, Lord, I just need to talk to you. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, and you know the Lord's Prayer most likely, if you read the Lord's Prayer, if you pray the Lord's Prayer, it takes about 20 seconds. I mean, when Jesus sat down to say, here's how it's done, you'd think it'd be a four-day seminar. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Here's what we can learn from it. I mean, it's fairly simple. I just want to be close to you, Jesus. I just want to hear from you. I just need to say something to you. I just need to listen to you. I just like being with you. It's, it's that simple. It'd be like me calling you up and saying, hey, can we just get together? Right? It's not complicated. Now, that's really the essence of all this. But in essence, it is also an act of faith. Something that, you know, uh, is worth the risk. You look at each one of them. And it was worth the risk to them to call out to Jesus. And that's really what prayer is. It's an act of faith. I don't want to beat this to death, but you got to know how simple it is to just reach out and just say, God, you know, I, I need to talk to you. I want to take you to the cross. There were seven statements Jesus made on the cross, all right? And three of them were prayers. Did you know that? Listen to these prayers Jesus uttered from the cross. The first one is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The second one was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the third one was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that was the last thing he said. Three prayers. Do you see how short those were? Now, I understand. You could say, well, he's on the cross. He's short of breath. But I want to tell you that, you know what, I think everything he did was on purpose. And I think what he's saying is, it really can be as simple as this. Uh, each one of them has some elements to it. If you look at it, as brief as they are, there is the address, Father, my God. Okay, there's the address. There's the request, forgive them. There's a question, why have you abandoned me? And there's a statement to you, I commit my spirit to you, okay? So again, think about those different categories. Now let's go to what he taught his disciples how to pray. The address, our Father in heaven, you are holy. There's the address. Number two, the question, your kingdom come, your will be done. That literally is him saying, Father, what is your will here? Okay, I, I, I care about your will. What is it you want us to do? The request, give us this day, our daily bread and he goes from there the statement of trust is at the end and it's in later manuscripts you may not have it in your text but it is for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever amen now I mentioned that his his both his teaching of prayer lasts about 20 seconds and the combination of the three prayers he uttered from the cross probably took about 20 seconds all right did he always just pray for 20 seconds? Because that would be great, right? Because I can pray for 20 seconds. No, like Mark 135 says that early in the morning while it was still dark, he went out and was alone with the Father and spent time praying with him. I guarantee you that was more than 20 seconds. When he was in the garden, remember he told his disciples to stay awake and they couldn't? Believe me, if that prayer was 20 seconds, I can stay awake for 20 seconds. That prayer may have lasted hours, who knows? So it's not that it's just as simple as a 20 second thing. The point is, it can be that simple, but more than likely, as you get to know the Lord, you're gonna to wanna to spend more time with him. What is this about? When they were devoted to prayer, was it a 20 second thing? My guess is, since they were devoted to it, it was something they did a lot. They did sometimes for long periods of time. But again, it's not that complicated, like the four stories that they all have in common. It is reaching out to the Lord. Again, to summarize, prayer is about seeking the presence of the Lord, be it two, 20 seconds or two hours. It doesn't matter. And prayer is about understanding that every word I speak and everything I do is to be done in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. 
your whole life can be a prayer because you're constantly aware of his presence in your life and so that conversation just goes on and on it's a never-ending conversation and if it's this important that you and I have the opportunity to come before the creator of the universe anytime we want anytime we want to ask for wisdom about this life for ask for insights about how we're supposed to interact with people but we can do that anytime if it's that simple and it's that powerful why don't we do it more why are we so sensitive about the idea of prayer I want to be real candid with you real vulnerable with you I'm gonna give you three things that keep me from praying okay and, and you may be able to relate to one or two or all three of them you may not be able to relate at all and if you don't God bless you you know but here are the three things as I prayed about this and thought about it here are the three things that are hurdles for me or challenges for me right up front is forgetfulness forgetfulness I forget about God not long ago we had the check engine light go on uh, in that vehicle that I was just uh, pointing to the windshield the windshield was a minor problem when the check engine light came on and I was a little concerned about it so I looked in the manual and the check engine light according to the manual is something that you better call your mechanic so I called my mechanic and I said our check engine light came on should I be concerned should I get it into you and here's the question he asked me he said is it blinking I said no it's not blinking he goes good because if it's blinking stop have it towed wow I had no idea it wasn't blinking I said so what could it be he said well it could be as simple as a gas cap that didn't get put on right or it could be as complicated as something wrong with the computer let's take a look at it. I scheduled a time to look at it uh, but the soonest I could get it into the mechanic was about a week well after about four days the check engine light went off you know Wow so I called him back I said it's off do I still need to come in he said no you don't need to come in don't worry about it all right so I tell you that because we all have options when we see something like that on the dashboard of our car don't we we can ignore it and just pretend like it's not there uh, we can look into it and go well, I don't really want to get it fixed I don't have the money or we can stop if it's blinking and say this is really important I got to get towed forgetfulness about God is like that check engine light all right God will bring it to our attention at different times if we go too long where we just are not even aware of God we don't even think about God and you may think that's crazy but most people even in the church don't think that much about God that often about God the reality is a check engine light may come on it may be blinking for some of us something goes on in our life and we realize I got to stop I've got to get on my knees that's the idea behind it and so the first thing is forgetfulness I quite honestly sometimes can go hours and hours and hours and hours and not think about God now and why is that a big deal I want to take you to Hosea 13 6 my guess is you weren't reading in Hosea this morning but listen to this prophet speaking for God and God says this through him when I fed them meaning my people when I fed them they were satisfied when they were satisfied they became proud then they forgot me look at what the sequence of events I took care of my people and they were satisfied they became satisfied and they became proud what are they proud of isn't it interesting how when life is going good we can become proud of our own lives of what we've accomplished and life is good I don't need God I don't think about God very often and that's what he says and when they became proud they forgot about me I believe when I am most satisfied in my life it's then that I tend to forget about God and when I forget about God I don't see the need to talk to him Does that make sense so if you find yourself in a position where you're you're really forgetting to pray let that be your check engine light and once you pay attention to it before it starts blinking is what I want to tell you there's an incident in Jesus life another one I want to read here very quickly it comes out of Luke chapter 17 verse 12 I'll start I'll read it from the message it says this as Jesus entered a village ten men all lepers met him they kept their distance but raised their voices calling out Jesus master have mercy on us taking a good look at them he said go show yourselves to the priests 
They went, and while still on their way, they became clean. Their leprosy just disappeared. Unbelievable. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful, he couldn't thank him enough, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, get up, go on your way. Your faith has saved you. It's healed you and it saved you, he says. Do you get that? There were nine Jewish lepers. Sounds like a start of a joke, right? Nine Jewish lepers, one Samaritan leper, an outsider. All ten are healed immediately. The rest of them just keep on going. One turns back and says, thank you, falls at Jesus' feet. Thank you so much. That is the reality that when my life becomes very satisfying, someone needs to be thanked, right? And it's not me. And only one out of the ten thank them. The religious guys, the guys with the religious heritage behind them, didn't even go back to thank him. Here's what I want you to get from that event. It mattered to Jesus. This one leper being grateful mattered to Jesus. The nine who weren't even grateful enough to turn around and say, thank you, you just saved my life, you just saved everything about my life. It mattered to Jesus. If it mattered to Jesus, it mattered to God. Forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. When I forget God, chances are I am not being very grateful to God. Forgetfulness of God keeps me from praying. The second hurdle I have personally is focus. Focus. I tend to lose my focus. Can you relate to that at all? There's a passage out of the uh, Sermon on the Mount where Jesus uh, says uh, in Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 and 6, he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who like to stand on the corners and pray so they can be seen by men. He says, instead, go into your inner room. Some versions say into your closet. Go into your closet where no one can see you. And there in your closet, pray in secret. And, the, and God who sees what's done in secret will reward you. There's a couple of things about that. First of all, Jesus certainly is talking about pride, right? He's certainly talking about how the religious leaders are prideful and they use prayer and it lead for for prideful purposes and you got to understand that pride is like the killer you know i mean it's what got satan been thrown out of heaven it's just a killer i don't know if you've heard this story great story about a dea officer that came onto a ranch property and he came up to the rancher and he said hey i need to check out your fields i'm looking for drugs and anything that you know related to that and uh, the rancher said well yeah, feel free to. He said, but I wouldn't go into that field right there. And the DEA officer looked at him and said, what? You're telling me there's someplace I can't go? He whips out his badge and he says, you see this badge? This badge says that I can go anywhere I want, anytime I want, and you can't stop me. So the rancher said, okay. He kind of shut up and he said, oh, all right, you know. So the DEA officer, of course, went into that field that he was told he shouldn't probably go into. And lo and behold, after just a few minutes, the rancher had turned around, but he heard some screaming. He turned back, and there was that agent, that DEA agent, running for his life with a huge bull behind him. And the bull, it was, it was obvious the bull was catching him and was going to gore him. And so the rancher drops his tools and just turns to the fence, and, and, he, and he yells out to the, uh, to the agent. He says, the badge, the badge, show him the badge. <laughs> I, I like that. Uh, <laughs> pride will kill us, you know. Arrogance will kill us. And if we're going to use prayer as a means to show off how great we are, we're in trouble. But I think there's even something else Jesus is saying in that part of the Sermon on the Mount. Go into your inner room. Go into your closet. Some say closet. You know, uh, it's interesting that this prayer shawl, um, when pulled over the head, the Jewish people kind of see it as a tent, as a place that helps them stay focused on prayer. I really think that, and, and when you hear them talk about it, I was listening to a, a Messianic Jew talk about pulling this over his head and how it helps him stay focused. I don't know what you need to do to stay focused. You know, I know what works for me. 
years ago I learned how to write my prayers. I have to focus because I got to focus on every letter I write. Or prayer walking helps me focus. Do whatever it does because that is a hurdle for me, is staying focused. And I've heard from a lot of people, it's a challenge. And the third hurdle for me, quite honestly, is what I'm going to call fidgety. I become fidgety or I become impatient, all right? Uh, another word is antsy. I become antsy. What do I mean by that? I tend to quit praying when I feel like ah, I'm not seeing anything change. Does that make sense? I am part of a culture, as are you, that has grown increasingly impatient. Have you noticed that? Waiting drives us nuts. I, I was confessing this to our house church just a week ago or I talked about getting on the phone and having to wait for 30 minutes to talk to somebody. And I was livid that I have to waste my time. Although watching a three-hour football game doesn't make me livid at all. Anyhow, moving on. You, you might know, uh, have heard about this on elevators, that that uh, door close button is just a placebo. That the system has to run and you can push as many times as you want, but it makes people feel better, like they're in control of the timing of this. Uh, there is, uh, if you've been over to Salt Lake City for the last many years, there's parts of that uh, of I-15 that is uh, under construction and has been, like I said, and will be. They're spending $1.6 billion on, on expanding that freeway. And they estimate, now get this, this is really good. They estimate that when they're done spending that $1.6 billion so that people can go faster and they don't have to wait in traffic, they will actually go one mile per hour faster. <laughs> Gary Thomas, in his book, Authentic Faith, says this, We serve a God whose calendar moves by millennia, not minutes, and who thinks in terms of generations, not seasons. Did you get that? It's so hard for us to be patient for even minutes. And so when we pray and things don't instantly happen, we think, well, what is the point of all this? Abraham was 75 years old when he was promised that an entire nation would come from him, but he didn't even have a child. He didn't even have a child. So how is it an entire nation going to come from him without even a child is the idea. He was 75 years old. He doesn't even have a son till he's 100 years old. You know that story, you know? It's crazy. The, the, this couple, it's 100 years old, you know, uh, has this newborn baby. There's not a tooth amongst them. They're all in diapers. So a quarter of a century had to pass before Abram even had a son by which supposedly some nation would come. you got to wait almost a century from that point before the promised land is actually achieved. Now think about that. The idea of waiting in Scripture is all throughout it. Patience is a part of the deal. Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, David says. In Psalm 37, 7, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. As you look around our culture, and we're going, Lord, what are you going to do? When are you going to change things? You know what he's saying? Wait. Wait. Oh, it kills us to wait. It is that fidgety nature I have that keeps me from praying sometimes. Because I think, what's the point? I need an answer to this right now. And I, I know, I know from history, I'm not going to get an answer right now. I need it right now. You know, it's part of the hurdles that we've got to jump over, that we've got to say, I will get past this and I will make this something I'm devoted to. There is no doubt about it. Prayer requires patience. And I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that this culture is a culture that demands that we move so quickly and things happen so instantaneously that prayer just doesn't fit in. And yet that's a hurdle we must get over. I'm going to read you something that I jotted down and I want to get it right. I'd rather not read it to you, but I want to get this right because it really expresses where I'm at with this. Waiting is the antidote for my drive to feel good that tends to overshadow my need to love better. Did you get that? I, I read a lot about this and that's really it. I have this drive inside me to feel good, you know? 
that's, that's our nature. We want to feel good and we want to feel better and we want to feel that now. Waiting is that antidote so that I quit focusing on feeling better and I start focusing on loving better. A couple months ago, I had the privilege of doing a graveside service uh, for a, a young man, I call him a young man because he was only 40, who died suddenly of a heart attack, uh, left a wife and two little girls. He had a very effective ministry with the Burmese people. And so when they asked me to, you know, do this service, I was privileged to do that. And he, he's a guy I've actually hunted with before and, and I'd known his family for years and years and years. And so right Dirt. before the service, his mom came to me and said, the Burmese people have come that he ministered to. Some of them have come and they're such special people. She said, please ask them to pray as a part of your time here. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I did you know, a short, brief message, and then I asked them through a translators, some of them spoke some English, I said, would you now pray? It was, it was amazing. Uh, these 10 or 12 people got up in front of the other folks, and then they just started praying, every one of them at the same time. And it sounded like chaos for a second. I guess it's fairly common in Southeast Asia and other places in the world for groups to get together and pray, and they all pray out loud at the same time like that. But here's what happened in me. I didn't even expect it, it shocked me. I was overwhelmed, not by their prayers, because they were in Burmese and I didn't understand a word of it. I was overwhelmed by God, by God. Because it hit me, a thought hit me that, I don't know if I've ever had, maybe I've had it, but I've never dwelt on it very long. God is so vast, so awesome that even if 10 of us are praying out loud at the same time, he hears each one of our prayers separately and understands what we're saying. And not only that, there are millions, if not billions of people around the earth praying to him at the same time. And he hears each prayer and he answers each prayer. See, that's the thing about being devoted to prayer is I believe you come to the place where you're not in awe of your abilities to pray, you become in awe of God, that he has the ability to listen to all of us, care about all of our needs, all of our desires, all of our hurts, all of our pains. Let me end with this. Shel Silverstein, the children's writer, once wrote the prayer of the selfish child. Let me read to you the prayer of the selfish child. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my toys to break so none of the other kids can use them. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if any kids ever prayed that. He's probably thought that. The truth is, as children, we come to our parents with all kinds of requests. They're oftentimes selfish. They're oftentimes, they have maybe some evil motives. Uh, they're they're sometimes gorgeous. The requests they come to us with come from a myriad of motives. But the only thing that matters to me as a parent is that my kids come to me. You know what I'm saying? You can come and ask anything of me. You can come and really say anything to me. Because what matters to me is you come to me. As a father, I think that's as close to the heart of my father I can get. Just come to me, just reach out, just be devoted to spending time with me.